on the Friday um, morning of the ISICOM Congress. Um, we would like to start with the session on sedation, and our first speaker will be Victoria McCready from the University of Toronto, talking about optimal sedation and acute brain injury. The floor is yours. Thanks very much. And thanks everyone for coming to this last day, early morning session. Um, great, so I'm gonna be talking uh, specifically about the uses of sedation in acute brain injury, and I have no disclosures relevant to this talk. So we'll go through briefly indications for sedation in neuro ICU, the agents and the practices that we see used, and then try to think about an optimal way to monitor and targets in this specific patient population. So the indications for sedation in general ICU, I think we all know control of anxiety, pain, discomfort, agitation, and mechanical ventilation dyssynchrony. When we move over and think about our acutely brain injured patients, we also, in addition, have very brain specific indications, trying to reduce the cerebral metabolic demand, help manage in intracranial hypertension treatment, control seizures, and help with targeted temperature management. And I sum this up as thinking about this really as we're using sedation for neural protection. And if we think about how we might do that uh, neural protection with specific regards to intracranial hypertension, we're trying to avoid coughing, increases in intrathoracic pressure, causing back pressure in our CVP, which then at the, the sagittal sinus and the Starling resistor may cause an increase in ICP, uh, tr treating seizures and again reducing our metabolic demand. And then reducing pain and agitation, any surges in blood pressure. This is particularly relevant in patients who have loss of autoregulation and may be pressure passive. So as you push up the blood pressure because they're agitated and in pain, they may increase their cerebral blood volume and increase their ICP. And then we, we manipulate um, their CO2 targets using sedation to achieve that to help with vasoconstriction. And then the one that we all think of reducing the CMRO2 uh, to help reduce cerebral blood uh, flow and volume. And this really is on the premise that there is flow metabolism coupling. Um, and if not, our concern would be that this may cause some issues. And if we go a little further into that and think about it, so when we think about flow metabolism coupling, we are hoping that it is coupled, and as we use sedation, we are dropping the metabolic rate, and then hopefully in tandem, dropping the cerebral blood flow that was helping us with our ICP. There is a concern though that if we were to mismatch, i.e. drop the flow from a blood pressure perspective, which is one of the concerns with propofol, relative to the amount of metabolism, we could precipitate ischemia. We could, on the other side, drop metabolism even more and get um, a luxury perfusion and hyperemia. If we look at the data, and this is a, an older study, but you know this is a small, 10 patients, but important work uh, back in 2002, looking at this is normal brains who are undergoing general anesthesia, and looking at the premise of propofol preserves uh, flow metabolism coupling, because there has been a, some controversy about whether this actually propofol may contribute to uncoupling. And here, using the, the Key Schmidt method, the estimated cerebral blood flow in CMRO2, and you can see that both after a propofol intervention drop, but their uh, arterial venous difference of oxygen stays the same. Um, so the, you would say here that um, flow metabolism coupling has remained and is, is intact. But we're more interested in acutely brain injured patients, so if we move over, and this is from the Cambridge group with David Menon and Gupta, and they looked at 10 traumatic brain injured patients, and they use a surrogate, so they look at uh, burst suppression ratio, and as they use a propofol intervention, you can see that they nicely increase the burst suppression to nearly 50%, which then indicates that they've got a drop in the CMRO2, which is a surrogate, or at least an indirect link. And here we can see a global measure with a, a jugular bulb and a, a more regional, using a brain tissue oxygenation probe, we can see that there is no change as we do this intervention. And so here we would say that their cerebral blood flow must have uh, indirectly dropped, or at least this is indirect evidence that has dropped because you're maintaining a constant AVODO2. So as if your blood flow did not drop, you would find a decrease in your extraction and your AVODO2 DO2 would uh, drop subsequently. 
What was also mentioned in this paper is use of propofol to try and help with these ischemic areas indicated by this brain tissue oxygenation probe. And if you can see those measures of three and after the intervention are still three, and that indicates that there's quite severe cerebral um, um, hypoxemia or hypoxic brain tissue there. And the hope was that maybe this intervention might help with that ischemic burden. And we can see that subsequently after the intervention, it has not, sorry, it's a bit obscured by the, there you go, you can see three and it has not changed and it remains 3.1. What is interesting is a lot of the time we also use Propofol to try and help with our ICP, and here we still see no difference after the intervention with ICP, although we do see a drop in the cerebral metabolic rate. So the competing goals I always think about in my neuro ICU is I'm trying to use deeper sedation to control the ICP and the metabolic demand, shivering and any associated metabolic demand systemically, and help to prevent seizures. But at the same time, I might think about using lighter sedation to try and help minimize any confounding when I neuroprognosticate. Uh, allow me to do frequent uh, neuro checks for neurological wake-up tests while trying to avoid uh, hypotension and drop in perfusion pressures and potentially reduce our length of stay and uh, duration of ICU. And so sedation here, as I talked about, obscures our clinical exam. Um, your clinical exam should always be your first neurological monitor. Um, but there has been some nice data uh, from the Skogeland group as well as Raymond Helmock. Uh, this again is a little bit older, but I think really important to show that at least in these studies showed when you do a neurological wake-up test, a hold of sedation increases in blood pressure and heart rate, rises in ICP and, and perfusion pressure drops, and differential rate, uh, results for your cerebral microdialysis um, as well as brain tissue oxygenation. So a kind of quick and dirty summary of all that would be about 30 to 40% you're not going to be able to wake up. Another 30, 40% you're going to get so concerned while you're doing it, you're going to abort uh, your sedation interruption. And then about another, um, well, the important thing is, is how many of these people are you going to see improve or detect a neurological deterioration when you hold your sedation and acutely brain injured patients like this? And about 50% actually show an improvement in their GCS. So Prax backs up your priors that you're feeling comfortable that you're, you're at least doing your job and you feel that they have not deteriorated. Um, but you actually on these neuro checks, and I'll show some data later, don't actually detect many neurological deteriorations. So patients I don't work wake up is people with intracranial hypertension, uh, people who I'm doing targeted temperature management, status, uh, sorry, in addition to the general ICU indications. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the sedation agents. I'm not going to go into too much detail because our next speaker um, is really going to fo focus on ketamine and neuroprotective effects, I think. And I would say as a get, uh, take home, if there's any review paper to go and read, this is a great one here. Um, it was back in 2019, but still very relevant by um, Gert Mayfreud, who's doing the next talk. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit more specifically about uh, trials using different regimes. This is a, a systematic review um, with Derek Roberts and the Edmonton and Calgary group in Canada. It again is older, but it, there hasn't really been much data since then. Uh, it had 13 RCTs and there was uh, low numbers of patients enrolled in each of these, so a moderate risk of bias here. But they were looking at, is there any difference between mainly a propofol and midazolam uh, in regards to adverse events uh, and safety? And overall, you can see that there was really no difference other than uh, sedation, so the bottom, very low evidence, one study only, showed that if you use just sedation, propofol, versus analgesic regime of morphine, we can see that with the, the morphine, there was a definite increase in the, the ICP and intracranial hypertension, most likely through concern of uh, not affecting your CMRO2 or your metabolic demand. So moving on, and this is more recent data uh, from uh, Paul and colleagues looking at two sedation regime, regimes in um, cardiac arrest. And this was from the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest registry. It was 460 patients, so a lot bigger than the ones I'd showed you before. And they looked at one which was propofol, uh, sorry, midaz fentanyl was used initially. Then they had a crossover period where they, they switched to using propofol remifentanil. And here is the two regimes showing it, the, how long it took for them to wake up. And I've just indicated the orange bar is everyone who was ever going to wake up who woke up. And everyone below that, 
took either were comatose and never woke up and eventually they all died, so below that line. And we can quite clearly see here that using a propofol regime, they are more likely to wake up quicker. And even the last patient who does, who does awaken is substantially or significantly um, earlier, allowing us maybe more as a resource utility, allowing us to reduce the duration of mechanical ventilation of length of stay uh, and allowing us to prognosticate earlier, understanding the concerns about self-fulfilling prophecies and uh, pessimism if we do too early prognostication in, in our neuro patients. So with propofol remifentanil, we might say there's significantly early awakening, uh, a decrease in our ventilator or increase in our ventilator free days, uh, a drop in um, catechol free days, so vasopressors, and, but no overall change in survival and neurological outcome. This uh, is a very, probably one of the biggest uh, epidemiological studies that is from um, Europe, Australia and UK. It came out in October last year, uh, 262 patients looking at those specifically who had severe traumatic brain injury and ICP monitoring in place. And I just wanted to highlight, so the, the majority here um, got propofol is the agent of choice. And this is looking over days of ICU. Um, and then what was uh, for me, surprising was the amount of people who had no sedation during this. And so this is a, a group of severe traumatic brain injury with admission GCS of three, and about 30% of these patients went on to have decompressive craniectomy. But a, a majority of these patients had no sedation coming in, and for the first seven days. And we can see here that the, the analgal sedation regime, fentanyl, was the most used opioid. And overall, uh, I have to convince you, but the data suggests that there was definitely more um, analgesia used in the midazolam group. Changes, so we always talk about we prefer propofol. I would say that there is really no great data to show that propofol drops ICP more than midazolam. Um, probably the benefits, at least for me, is that just the quick on offset and the pharmacokinetics of propofol versus midazolam. And here I just wanted to indicate that this group was, although there are some of the bars indicate higher ICP in a couple of patients, the majority were very well controlled intracranial hypertension. And there was an exploratory analysis just looking at a 60-day outcome. Uh, this was non-significant, but you might try to tell yourself there's a, a survival benefit there approaching with propofol, uh, but more study is definitely needed. And the, the, this is purely ex exploratory. They went on to look at favorable outcome and they saw that propofol versus midazolam. So midazolam had a much better overall favorable outcome at discharge. And I would just posit though, that there, if you look in the small print, their percentage of missingness was 36%. And I worry about this is not missing at random. And so a differential bias that they may actually, the people that are missing are those that are dead, which could have added into midazolam's deceased or unfavorable group. So I, I really think that this is uh, purely exploratory um, and, and we can't really d put much weight on this. We had looked at a survey of, so it's always nice to look at what they observe versus what we actually do. And this is um, uh, what we report. And so when we ask people a vignette of a severe traumatic brain injury with a high ICP, uh, this was in North America and Europe. And we asked, would you sedate this patient? I think all of us would probably say yes. And just why? So people, again, the main reason is to drop the metabolic rate. But a lot of people you talked about uh, standard treatment and, and protocolized treatment within their centers, which is um, uh, interesting because there really isn't gr any great data for protocolizing care in this. But it seems a lot of institutions are instigating this. And we can see that uh, the majority of agents used was propofol here. And when we looked at those who uh, used propofol, they said that this was really their primary agent um, I recommended again through an institutional protocol. So again, I think the idea of protocolization of this, I have to say there isn't great data about it. Uh, we had used a protocol in one of our um, sites, and I'll say that we find that actually people were getting over sedated, and then the ward was always complaining about why these patients were taking so long to wake up compared to historical controls. Um, so just the concerns about over protocolization of this. Um, I have about a minute left, but I just wanted to delve into a little bit of, we talked about the agents, how we might monitor these patients in the neuro ICU. So we talk about our clinical uh, assessment tools, so the RAS and SAS, which are measured intermittently and they are somewhat subjective. And they respond or rely on our stimulation of the patient. So the concern about, like we talked before, increasing blood pressure as we stimulate them. 
And as they drop into a lower conscious level, that it is really not that great once you are, have an unconscious patient uh, and the validity there isn't as good. Um, and it's it released for our targets, which is trying to think about ICP. Um, and then what we might think about is there ways that we can use uh, non-stimulating methods uh, to continuously monitor their sedative state. And this is a, a recent paper by Frank Rosullo and colleagues looking at processed EEG and an expert panel got together and looked at four domains. Um, here, there was about 59 statements and I'm not gonna go through all of them, just to say that uh, they say that clinical assessment is still your number one choice, um, but that there may be a, a, an avenue for processed EEG, especially if we're targeting deep sedation, um, but there is gonna be a training a curve with this and a recertification, that, so that's the bigger concern. In the interest of time, I'm just going to skip to the end, which is to say, I think that as we move towards sedation, uh, we should, thinking about it in your ICU, we tailor it to certain uh, monitoring targets. And here I've just suggested a couple that I would think about. And so in summary, I'd say propofol appears to be the most widely agent used globally. We think about sedation more in neuroprotective and um, we always, I think about a specific therapeutic goal when I'm using this, but we have to weigh up the risks and benefits when we're thinking about deeper versus lighter sedation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victoria. Very interesting talk. Uh, have we got any questions from the audience? Please do ask them. A very quick question. In the cohort that you have shown, um, comparing midazolam and fentanyl versus um, remifentanyl and propofol, the poll um, study, how much do you think the effect was of uh, remifentanyl versus fentanyl, whereas clearly propofol versus midazolam? In, I'm trying to remember the... In because the, it, it, intuitively, it should be that they're waking up earlier because the fentanyl is not accumulating. So that would be one of the elements of that. Oh, right. You're talking change. about the specific outcome of yeah. uh, time to awakening. Yes. I mean, I think it's probably a joint an analgal sedation effect for sure. I did not highlight the, the analgesia component, but definitely um, said um, analgesia, what are your choice of drug is definitely an important factor and dimension here to consider. Sure. Thank you. There's no other questions from the audience. Maybe, oh, you can't escape. Come back. I've got one. <laughs> well, one more. So I'm like so eager to just run. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you to give Gitz talk for him because he's going to talk about ketamine. But you did allude to the, uh, the different mechanisms of action of the different sedatives, the GABA agents, the ketamine, and MDA, um, and the opioids. And, and you, you, you did show some evidence for some short-term differences in, in outcome, ICP and so on. But would you just want to make a comment on, on if there is any evidence for the longer term uh, consequences of choosing one of those sedatives over another? Yeah, you mean maybe more from a functional and yeah. survival? Yeah. I mean, I, I think the data isn't so much there. You can see that one that um, was recently published was trying to, to look at functional outcome and that exploratory analysis. And I would, I would just say I think that that is... Um, uh, it, the data there, I, I, I wouldn't put any weight on it. Um, so I, I do think further studies are definitely uh, needed. You know, I think of the, the big, great studies in general ICU, right? Like Sleep by Sangeeta Mehta and John Cress and, and Tim Gerrard. Um, and we desperately need that kind of long-term outcome data for our neuropatients. And it can't just be survival, right? It's got nothing to do with survival. <laughs> it's all about functional outcome. So. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right, uh, so our next speaker is uh, Geert Merfreut, uh, who uh, is coming to us from, uh, well, from Belgium, and he's going to address the particular question of ketamine as an alternative uh, sedative. So, Geert. Yeah, thanks for the kind introduction. So those are my disclosures. None of them related, I think, to this talk, although I am the PI of the uh, um, um, bike study, brain injury and ketamine study, for which the study drug is supplied by Pfizer. Anyway, I read this in the news last week that uh, Elon Musk is taking regularly ketamine uh, for his depression and he's, this is such an altruistic man that he doesn't do it for himself, he does it for his poor shareholders who otherwise would lose uh, value. Uh, now, what is uh, the mechanism of antidepressant effect by ketamine is actually quite similar to the anesthetic effect. So, of course, we have uh, NM, um, NMDA antagonism, uh, which normally would uh, lead to excitotoxicity. Uh, 
but what we do when we block uh, this pathway through, uh, the, through blocking the NMDA receptor um, is that we um, reduce uh, the, act uh, the activation of uh, eukaryote elongation factor 2, reduce phosphorylation of that enzyme, and that might have a sustained effect through the brain-derived neurotropic factor, um, and also to mTOR uh, um, activation uh, via the uh, inhibitory uh, uh, postsynaptic uh, neurons that might have sustained this effect through neuroplasticity. Now, of course, this is not proven. This is a hypothesis of, um, of, of psychiatrists and, and, and neuropharmacologists, uh, uh, but still it, it, look, it appears that it's quite similar to what we think the effect might be uh, in, uh, of ketamine the way we use it. Now, of course, the, the reason why we use ketamine for the moment has, in most cases, nothing to do with the potential neuroprotective uh, effect. Why we use it is because it has uh, a very favorable pharmacokinetic profile, it works fast, it's eliminated uh, rapidly if you uh, inject it once, and it has a favorable respiratory and hemodynamic uh, profile. Now, um, when it comes to um, the effect on cerebral blood flow, we've always learned, and this is very old work because this is a study from the 70s uh, already, but we know that uh, ketamine increases the cerebral blood flow more than it increases cerebral metabolism, uh, which makes it uh, a bit unique in, in all the sedatives that we use because most, in most sedatives that we use that work through GABA, we see a reduction in cerebral blood flow as well as a reduction uh, in, uh, metabol in, in metabolism, which means that the two phenomena are coupled in what we normally use and that they might be uncoupled here. Now, if we look into detail what happens in the brain, it appears that the effect of ketamine is not uniform across the brain. So we see increases in cerebral blood flow in certain areas, mainly located anteriorly, whereas in a, a, a number of lower centers, we see actually a, a reduction in uh, cerebral blood flow. There's also um, a global reduction of the uh, uh, regional oxygen ejection fraction, and there's actually a weakening of the correlation between cerebral blood flow and uh, cerebral metabolism on the global scale, as, as, as the early studies from the 70s have shown, but also on the regional uh, scale. Now, We've always learned, at least when I was a, a resident or medical student, that we shouldn't use ketamine in patients with elevated ICP. And you would have thought that for such, such a strong recommendation there was strong evidence, and actually there is not. So this was based on two studies from the early 70s on 11 and 7 patients. One group of uh, patients who had sp spinal catheterine for simple surgery, they wouldn't use them with ketamine, and then they saw the CSF pressure going up. Patients were not ventilated during the procedure. Second study, 7 children with a ventricular atrial shunt that were, uh, for a reason, deconnected, they wouldn't use them with ketamine and then the ICP would go up. So that was the evidence, 18 patients uh, and together with ketamine getting out of fashion in the 70s because the other anesthetics were rising, this is the reason why we didn't use it, why, why people stopped using it for these patients. And actually this is not true, so there is no worry uh, to use ketamine in patients at risk for elevated ICP. And Fred Seiler looked at this uh, and, and he wrote this very nice review um, where a lot of adult, where 100 uh, adult patients and about 60 pediatric patients uh, were included, where he actually found that there was no effect on intracranial pressure in any of the studies, and actually in, in some of the studies there was even an, a decrease in intracranial pressure after using uh, ketamine, but there was a favorable hemodynamic effect, which is still the reason why we use uh, uh, ketamine, I think, in most cases. So he concluded that it doesn't increase the ICP in severe TBI patients, provided they're already sedated and mechanically ventilated and there might be even a lowering effect. And this is also true in non-traumatic uh, um, uh, uh, brain injury. So also in non-traumatic uh, brain injury there was no uh, increase in intracranial pressure uh, in adults uh, and in pediatric patients. And so here as well there's, there's, there's no evidence to support or the, 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 the there's no evidence to support that the ICP would go up and actually it might even go down in the sedated and ventilated patients provided that you control their CO2. 
ketamine from the beginning and actually was, was the most used sedative in the, in the Vietnam War. So it, uh, the military use of ketamine has been uh, very high from, from the beginning because of that profile, because it's so easy to use. This is a study where they looked uh, uh, 10 years back in the combat use of, of ketamine and they didn't found uh, an effect uh, on, um, on hospital length of stay nor an effect of survival. So they couldn't demonstrate any harm by using ketamine. Now, if you use ketamine as an induction agent in patients who are not yet uh, ventilated, uh, but who you, of course, will ventilate after induction, uh, in this uh, uh, small pediatric series uh, with patients at risk for intracranial hypertension, they did find that uh, even after induction with uh, ketamine, that it appears to be safe with regards to ICP, and that in all of these uh, patients, the ICP either decreased or state uh, the same uh, whether you use ketamine uh, or not. Um, ketamine as an anesthetic for uh, patients with, with, T, with TBI, what do the studies say? There's not a lot of data around, uh, only uh, a couple of smaller studies uh, at several doses and infusion rates, but um, uh, the, so no study actually reported adverse event with relate to, to increased ICP. Seven of these studies investigated ICP. No studies reported increased mortality. Uh, on, one study uh, pointed to the favorable hemodynamic profile and three studies reported a decrease in cortical spreading depolarization. So it appears to be safe or at least not unsafe to use ketamine in brain injured patients, but can it be neuroprotective? And there's several ways why ketamine can be neuroprotective. I already alluded to it in my introductory slide when I uh, discussed the effect on, uh, on uh, depression. Uh, but one of these, this is actually a very nice uh, paper in Nature Reviews uh, on, on the potential um, um, neuroprotective effect through modulation of excitotoxicity. So what typically happens if a neuron is excited, it will release glutamate, and this glutamate will have a postsynaptic effect, will initiate calcium influx, and will initiate uh, inflammation, for instance, through expression of NF-kappa B. And there's nice experimental work of that, that actually the blockade of NF-kappa B, and this is uh, a study by Sakai um, on cell cultures, where he uh, infused the cell cultures with uh, lipopolysaccharide uh, and inducing an inflammatory, um, an inflammatory damage to, that, uh, to, to those cell cultures. This could actually be attenuated with high or medium dose uh, ketamine, as you can see here, that he... Um, that the, the, the NF-kappa B expression actually disappears if you give ketamine at the same time. This actually this confirms this theory of um, modulating excitotoxicity that can be potentially uh, beneficial. Any clinical, clinical data about this effect are very rare. So this is a small study of 24 uh, infants who were on uh, cardiopulmonary bypass for VSD repair, randomized to ketamine and placebo. They looked at NSE, they looked at S100B, so uh, markers of neuronal or glial damage. There was no difference in it too. There was also no difference in neurodevelopment tests, but of course only very short term. But what is interesting is if they did MR spectroscopy in these children that they could see a decrease in glutamate concentration in the frontal white matter of these children in the ketamine uh, group. This, of course, doesn't prove, but it's, it sort of confirms the hypothesis. If we look at a brain that is suffering, um, what you can often see if you put in uh, invasive probes in these patients are cortical spreading depolarizations. Now, cortical spreading depolarization are sort of a sign of uh, loss of ion homeostasis over the cortex, and they will spread over the cortex, as you can see right here, if you put a cortical electrode on that cortex, and they're uh, associated with, with, with brain damage and with a suffering brain, and they're very hard to modulate. And actually, one of the only drugs that is able to modulate Relate uh, CSDs is, is ketamine. So this is this is a case of one patient where actually after the uh, after uh, starting ketamine that the CSDs uh, disappear. Um, and this is this is also this is of course the, uh, almost case reports uh, because these are two patients, but still they tried to give fentanyl medazolam to stop the CSDs and, and uh, they only stopped after giving ketamine. Uh, 
This is probably the largest series that looked at CSDs and ketamine uh, from the COSBIC group, uh, 115 patients, and they could show that, um, so this is an observational study, so not an interventional trial, but what they could see is that the only drug that was associated with, uh, with less uh, cortical sp uh, spreading depolarizations, you can see here that the, 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 the readings without uh, um, CSDs, uh, in most cases the readings with ketamine, and actually the only drug that has showed a significant reduction of the association of, uh, of, of uh, an, an, an reduction of CSDs, sorry, a reduced odds ratio of CSDs was ketamine. And this is, well, we also sort of use uh, ketamine as a drug to treat, uh, to treat the refractory seizures as well, because we know that in prolonged seizures, seizures we usually treat with GABA agents like benzodiazepines, felproic acid, uh, or propofol or barbiturates if necessary, if we can't really control them. But we know that as seizures prolong, that the GABA, um, um, the number of GABA receptors on the postsynaptic membrane will decrease and that these GABA acting agents will lose efficacy, whereas the number of uh, NMDA receptors will increase when the GABA receptor activity decreases and and several groups have, have looked into this and and of course this is this is rescue therapy so this was this has never been investigated in a randomized trial but if you look at meta-analysis or uh, these, these are two very nice meta-analysis where they looked at the studies that have used ketamine as a last agent and in a lot of these cases it was successful in stopping uh, these uh, these seizures um, and in this uh, um, uh, large uh, this, this this is a patient level uh, analysis of 58 uh, subjects where they had 60 episodes of RSE. Ketamine was the last added drug in 12% of these cases and it contributed to per permanent control in about one third of these uh, cases. And if you can control these, uh, these uh, refractory status epilepticus, you reduce uh, mortality. So in summary, I think that there's no evidence. So the evidence that there's harm by ketamine is actually not present. So the evidence that ketamine increases the ICP, and especially if the patients are already mechanically ventilated or caused, administered with other sedatives, is actually not true. So there's no evidence that it does this. There's some experimental evidence and some clinical indication that it might be neuroprotective, mainly through, through inhibition of glutamate excitotoxicity. If you use it to treat uh, uh, refractory intracranial hypertension, some centers do use it because they ran out of other sedatives. Uh, it is increasingly being used off-label, but there's no, uh, no data to support this practice. Um, and ketamine for refractory or super refractory status epilepticus is frequently used, although there are no uh, prospective studies that support this practice. For the moment, we are uh, here in Belgium running the multicenter brain injury in ketamine uh, trials, or the bike study, where we will uh, randomize 100 patients to, um, with, with an ICP monitor in place uh, to, um, and that are sedated for uh, ICP control to uh, ketamine at the dose of one uh, milligram per kilogram per hour versus uh, placebo. This is, uh, I, I got some support by the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. And as I said, Pfizer su uh, supplies uh, the study drug. What are we looking at is safety. Does it increase the ICP when we add it to, uh, to standard sedatives um, and efficacy. Um, if, if we use ketamine, if we add ketamine, can we, imp uh, can we imp do, do we have to give other, less other therapies to control the ICP? So does it reduce the therapeutic intensity uh, level score? For the moment, uh, we are at almost 60 patients of our 100 patients. So I hope that in a bit more than a year, we will be able to finalize uh, the trial. And with that, I would like to conclude. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> okay, thank you. Are there any questions in the audience? Yeah, in the front here. You might just repeat the question first. Can you, can yeah. you repeat so, the so question the, the with question the microphone? Is, is, uh, is whether there's a place for other um, um, and MDA receptor inhibitors, that could be, we don't know. Uh, I know that we have done uh, a study, or my colleagues from anesthesia have done a study on xenon and neuroprotection in uh, patient cardiopulmonary bypass, and the study was neutral. Uh, also for the effect on delirium and, and other outcomes. 
but it could it could very well uh, be indeed there's no reason why the others would not have uh, would not have that effect of course the advantage of ketamine is that it's widely available that is cheap um, and also in let's say lower middle income countries it's a drug that is that is there and so i think that is why it might be a good uh, well, that's for me one of the motivations to investigate in this compound rather than in in other maybe more expensive compounds there is one more question oh, yeah. Yeah. From, from the audience. Um, like Might just get you to wait for the microphone because there's people watching uh, online as well. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I would like to ask about personalization of ketamine. Are there any patients that you are uh, thinking that they will have more benefit or patient that you uh, dislike using it? Uh, what about a psychiatric uh, patient, patient with the uh, a history of uh, overdose do you yeah. use it more or less in those patients yeah it's 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 a tough question of course because we don't know whether there's a, an overall benefit of using it yet eh? so there's, there's some indirect evidence so let alone that we have ideas on specific sub subgroups that we might uh, want to target um, I always try to be pragmatic so the, the the bike study is also a pragmatic trial so what is why do we use it currently because of the, as, as you heard in the previous talk, because of the, the potential side effects of other sedatives, for instance, in ICP control, that you're sort of at the upper dose limit of propofol, that you're concerned about using midazolam for too long, and that, that it's added on. And so we just decided to randomize, and that's why we, why we do. I think patients with refractory seizures are, uh, are definitely a, a group where we would use it. I don't know if in patients with psychiatric disease or for the antidepressant effect, that the acute uh, let's say administration of ketamine in the framework of, of anesthesia or critical care would make any difference. I think to have this sustained effect on neuroplasticity, as has been hypothesized, that that would be the effect. Um, I think it needs it needs more prolonged uh, administration. There's no other questions for the audience. I'm going to take the chair's prerogative to ask you one of about your, your bike study, <laughs> which is very. Uh, enticing, uh, 100 patients, so relatively small, yeah. and so appropriately looking at, you might say, surrogate outcomes, the ICP and so on. So if I take you forward and you're playing the odds, let's say that there's no difference between the two groups, um, but it's safe. It, yeah. Would you then go on to do, or would you think there would then be reason to fund an equipoise to fund a, a much larger study to see if there's patient-centered outcome? Yeah, absolutely. That is, that is the idea of doing yeah. that. So that's what I really would like to do is do a, and, and, and in multiple settings, in, in, in high income settings, but also in low and middle income settings. And then in the settings where it's possible, we would, I would like to have, or to be able to look at markers of neuroinflammation as well. So to have the mechanistic reason why it would work and why it would be neuroprotective. Of course, standardizing the, the, the underlying sedative regimen might be a challenge, but I think we'd, we could come to that. But that indeed would be, um, well, the ambition of, 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 of setting that up. Yeah. Can I ask one last question of regarding course. the bike study, which is very interesting. I always look at the standard that we're comparing, because you will be having ketamine versus no ketamine, yeah. but what is the standard sedation in those eight centers that are included? The, yeah, so, so there it's might a, be an inter interplay between the agents. Yeah, it's a study in, here in Belgium, and so there's not that much difference between what we do in these centers. So what, what most of us would do is a combination of, of uh, to, to control ICP, let's say tier zero, tier one, is a combination of propofol and, and an opioid. It can be remifentanil, it can be fentanyl as well. And then usually the second sedative, as, as has been shown by international service as well, is medazolam. And then people start to, then we don't know anymore. And that's where we, uh, well, early on, of course, randomize and add the, the ketamine. So yeah. that comes as a third agent? That comes as a third agent, but of course, okay. through the randomization, it started immediately or not. Yeah. All right. Thank you. If there are no more questions, thank you very Thanks. much, Gert, for a very interesting talk. Let's give a loud round of applause. Uh, the third talk this morning will be Optimal Sedation During Assisted Ventilation. Ewan uh, Golliger from the University of Toronto. Thank good you. Good morning. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, we're going to shift gears away from the brain a little bit, or at least a different part of the brain, to focus on
the respiratory uh, uh, centers and the influence of sedation on, on the control of breathing. And uh, I'm not here to tell you exactly what the best way to sedate patients is during assisted ventilation, but I want to introduce the concept of sedation ventilation interaction. This idea that sedation modifies the effect of the ventilator on the patient and the ventilator modifies the effect of sedation on the patient. And that's probably the, the core concept for us to think about. And I think that's important uh, for us if we uh, are increasingly focused on managing respiratory drive and respiratory effort uh, when we're setting the ventilator. These are my disclosures, none of which are particularly relevant. So, so why do sedation and ventilation uh, need to be integrated? Why do we need to take a more integrative approach? Traditionally, when we're managing these two core supportive therapies for critically ill patients, we think of them in a very siloed fashion. You know, in, in Canada, uh, the nurses uh, manage the sedation and the respiratory therapists manage the ventilator and the doctors generally try to stay out of the way. Um, but uh, the truth is that these two interventions really affect one another, at least when it comes to the physiology of respiratory drives. So, so you know, obviously manipulating the ventilator modifies uh, respiratory homeostasis, but it also modifies respiratory drive and effort, patient ventilator synchrony, and often we're trying to adjust the ventilator during assisted ventilation to ensure that the patient's uh, respiratory distress is relieved. But at the same time, we're often using sedation for those uh, ends as well. You know, we, although we think about sedation in terms of depth of sedation, level of arousal, often we find ourselves giving uh, sedation in order to, to facilitate ventilation, to take away the dyssyncrity, to reduce the um, patient's uh, respiratory distress. So these two interventions are really acting on the same therapeutic goals. And because of that, um, if they, particularly if they modify one another, we need to take a more integrated approach. You know, there's obviously a ton of data emphasizing that sedation impacts outcomes of mechanical ventilation. And so just one uh, paper that's a relatively recent high impact study the WeanSafe uh, study found that the depth of sedation was by far the strongest uh, risk factor for uh, delayed weaning from mechanical ventilation. Now, of course, sometimes depth of sedation is unavoidable uh, given other kind of uh, characteristics of the patient, but it just speaks to the fact that the, that from from the out from the perspective of optimizing outcomes in mechanical ventilation sedation management is critical and we can't just keep sedation and, and ventilation apart and then there's this very intriguing data from the group of professor alex de moule in, in paris uh, they have a, a really important and exciting research program looking at the impact of, of dyspnea and a respiratory drive on uh, patient uh, outcomes. So for example, they've demonstrated that uh, dyspnea during mechanical ventilation is a major risk factor for long-term post-traumatic stress disorder after uh, acute respiratory failure. And just very recently, they reported here that there seems to be a fairly strong relationship in these patients between the respiratory drive and uh, the risk of death. So the higher the, the P.1 or the airway occlusion pressure, the lower the survival at, at 90 days. Now, of course, uh, more acutely ill, more severely ill patients will often manifest higher respiratory drive for a variety of reasons, but uh, potentially suggesting that um, there, this may become an important therapeutic target for us uh, in the management of, of ventilation. So with all that in mind, um, how, you know, how should we think about an approach to uh, sedation during assisted ventilation? Well, obviously, we're going to apply sedation uh, to uh, minimize distress and agitation and make sure the patient's safe, while also, of course, aiming to keep the patient as awake as possible and interactive as possible. So try to minimize that depth. But increasingly, one of the other uh, goals that we have during assisted ventilation is to optimize respiratory drive and effort. And we want to, for one thing, minimize the duration of apnea. There's now quite strong evidence that diaphragm inactivity during mechanical ventilation drives uh, a diaphragm atrophy and prolonged mechanical ventilation. So getting the diaphragm active as early as possible is an important therapeutic goal, making that transition to assisted ventilation. And sedation management is critical 
to getting the patient breathing. Uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about exactly how sedation should be used to that end. At the same time, uh, there's evidence to suggest, as I've already presented, that excessive drive may be associated with poor outcome. High drive and effort may uh, cause regional and global um, lung overdistension and injury, a phenomenon referred to as patient self-inflicted lung injury. And so uh, increasingly we're thinking about sometimes we may need to use sedation to limit lung stress and strain during spontaneous breathing. So the questions become, which sedatives are the most effective uh, for these therapeutic ends and how exactly to monitor uh, these parameters during uh, mechanical ventilation? I just discussed the monitoring very briefly. This is a, a, an important paper by Jeremy Beitler's group where they looked at the relationship between P0.1, again, this uh, classical measure of respiratory drive, and depth of sedation uh, uh, measured by the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale. And although we tend to think of patients uh, with, uh, who are more deeply sedated or uh, you know, have a lower level of arousal as also being uh, tending to have a suppressed drive to breathe, in fact, there was no relationship at all between depth of sedation and uh, respiratory drive. Indeed, many of the patients with, uh, who were relatively deeply sedated actually manifested a fairly high P0.1. So this just emphasizes the need for independent direct monitoring of, uh, of respiratory drive and effort. It's not just enough to measure your SAS or your RAS scale to, to understand the influence of, of sedation on drive and effort. You have to actually monitor these things directly because these are independent phenomenon. Now, one of the important things to appreciate is that different sedative classes have different patterns of effect on, on respiration. So if you look at, if you think about the respiratory pattern in terms of tidal volume and respiratory rate, it's interesting to compare how different sedatives impact uh, these different parameters and, and how that is modified between unassisted breathing and, and being on a mechanical ventilator. So this figure here comes from a systematic review that we just recently published, um, where we uh, you know, scoured the literature looking for studies that evaluated the effect of different sedatives on tidal volume and respiratory rate. And uh, what's uh, quite impressive is that you really see a significant variability between classes of sedatives. So propofol and inhaled anesthetics tend to have a significant effect on tidal volume in patients who are not assisted from the ventilator, um, whereas opioids and uh, other hypnotics like dexmedetomidine, ketamine, um, uh, tend to have less effect on the tidal volume. Now, on, in mechanical ventilation, and all, all the studies cited on the, on the right here use pressure support ventilation, there's no effect on tidal volume, but that's not really that surprising because in pressure support, the tidal volume that you get is largely determined by the pressure level set on the ventilator. And so really what would be going on here is that the propofol is probably reducing the drive and effort, but it's masked by, by the pressure support. So the, the, if you're trying to control uh, respiratory drive and effort, then, then propofol and potentially inhaled anesthetics, we're gonna have a talk about that in a moment, might be very effective uh, methods for doing so. By comparison, uh, when you look at respiratory rate, you can see that propofol, you know, what we classed as other hypnotics, and benzodiazepines have relatively uh, uh, no effect. But opioids, of course, have a significant uh, effect in reducing the respiratory rate, and the inhaled anesthetics seem to induce uh, tachypnea. And this is important because I think one of the big reasons why patients ride the ventilator passively is the use of, of of excessive opioids for sedation. You know, uh, opioids are kind of often our first uh, go-to class of agent for analgo sedation. And while that's entirely appropriate to ensure that pain is well controlled, often the opioids, if administered in excess, will keep the patient passively riding the ventilator because as long as the patient's intrinsic neural respiratory rate is less than that set by the ventilator, they're not gonna breathe. The ventilator will just uh, passively hyperventilate them. So to get a patient breathing under mechanical ventilation, one of the first things we need to do is start minimizing uh, exposure to unnecessary exposure to opioids to get the patient's intrinsic neural respiratory rate up, which will then get them to start triggering the ventilator and we can transition them to assisted ventilation more uh, earlier. This is a really fascinating uh, paper from uh, 
the group of uh, Marcelo Amato and uh, Giacomo Bolani just published in the Blue Journal this month, where they looked at the relationship between fentanyl dosage and the change in lung volume uh, following the administration of neuromuscular blockade. And uh, what you can see is that when the fentanyl dosage is relatively high, there's a relatively larger increase in lung volume after the administration of neuromuscular blockade. And what this highlights is the way in which opioids induce an increase in expiratory muscle effort. And that reduces lung volume. And then when you uh, um, ablate the expiratory muscle effort with the neuromuscular blocker, that allows a significant increase in lung volume. So the use of fentanyl may be a significant determinant of whether neuromuscular blockade improves lung mechanics or not. So this again highlights this very complex issue of sedation ventilation interaction. These two uh, interventions are, are modifying each other's effects. And so we need to be monitoring all, all of these elements closely. Uh, in a forthcoming paper, uh, we looked at the independent and interactive effects of ventilation and sedation on, on, on respiratory effort during pressure support ventilation. And uh, what, what we found is, and not surprisingly, that in, on average, as you increase pressure support, you progressively decrease the respiratory effort. Similarly, as you increase the propofol infusion rate, you see a decrease in respiratory effort. But uh, again, uh, confirming what we saw in our systematic review, increasing the fentanyl infusion rate really had no effect on respiratory effort. So if we're trying to control drive and effort to limit the lung descending pressure, then clearly propofol uh, would be preferable over, over fentanyl. And the interesting thing is that, um, I'll, I'll show this graphically in a moment, but the pressure level and the um, propofol level modified each other's effect. The higher the one, they tended to dampen the effect of the other. And similarly, ECMO had a, a dampening effect on the influence of propofol. So let me show you what I mean by that. So this figure here, uh, the two panels show respiratory drive or P0.1 and respiratory effort or the swing in esophageal pressure during assisted ventilation. And on the x-axis, you have the inspiratory pressure level and then the patients are grouped according to uh, the a relatively higher or lower level a propofol infusion rate. And when the propofol infusion rate is low, you, in the, the, the green line shows uh, a marked reduction in drive and effort as inspiratory pressure is increased. But if the uh, propofol infusion rate is high, then the, the ventilation has less influence on the patient's respiratory effort. So again, these interventions are, are, are uh, modifying uh, uh, each other's effects. And then on... Um, uh, this, this figure here looks at the relationship between being on ECMO and, and sedation, which is really very interesting. So uh, the x-axis here is the esophageal pressure, or the y-axis here is the esophageal pressure swing measuring respiratory effort, and the x-axis is the propofol infusion rate. And you can see that in patients on ECMO, propofol has uh, a le lesser effect on respiratory effort and compared to patients not on ECMO. And that's probably because the ECMO is very effective at obviously clearing CO2 and unloading the brainstem respiratory centers. And what's really interesting is that this suggests that, you know, ECLS, ECOR may have a potentially important role as a sedation sparing strategy because what you can see is that a propofol level of the respiratory effort level obtained at a propofol level of zero uh, on, on ECMO is approximately equivalent to the respiratory effort level obtained at a propofol infusion rate of, of 60 mics per kilo per minute in patients not on ECMO. So you can see the way in which ECLS uh, has a potentially uh, sedation sparing effect, which you know leads to this concept of so-called awake ECMO. All right, so um, we mainly focus on physiology and what I've tried to argue for is that, that we need to consider drive and effort as potential targets uh, for uh, uh, the management of uh, sedation. I, I think opioids, um, while they have obviously a critical role in managing pain, in general are less preferable in terms of managing assisted ventilation just because they have a profound effect depressing the respiratory rate and therefore predispose patients to apnea on mechanical ventilation. And they also increase expiratory muscle effort um, and chest wall rigidity. So uh, I think in general, these are uh, undesirable effects and an important area of investigation in the future is whether opioid sparing 
uh, strategy may actually um, improve outcomes during assisted ventilation. Propofol is clearly more effective than, uh, than fentanyl for controlling drive and effort. And the inhaled sedatives that we're about to hear about may have a really important role in optimizing assisted ventilation because of the pattern of ventilation that, that they induce. You know, given the fact that the ventilation and the sedation modify each other's effects, I think that means two things. We need A, to monitor uh, these effects, and B, we need to sort of try and get rid of the traditional silos of management and start developing protocols for ventilation and sedation that take each other's effects into account. And uh, so um, hopefully as, as we roll those kinds of protocols out into trials, we'll be able to start testing their impact on accelerating liberation from mechanical ventilation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have got a question from the audience. Can we please get the microphone? Thank you. I'm just wondering, because you showed the study on um, ECMO and non-ECMO patients with propofol, did that require some calculations uh, based on the increase in the volume of distribution? Because obviously the ECMO circuit adds some volume. Yeah, that's, a, that's an important point. We just looked at the infusion rate. So we weren't measuring the you know, serum concentrations or this is purely an analysis looking at the infusion rate delivered intravenously. But shouldn't that obscure the results? Well, um, no, it would, if, the, if that was the outcome, it might be importantly affected, but because it's the exposure and the outcome is respiratory effort, I don't, I, I don't think it's such an issue. It may be an explanation of why propofol has different effects on ECMO or not, but it wouldn't, wouldn't be a confounder of the result. There's no other questions for the audience. I, I just have a quick one. You, you've spoken about the opioids as if they're all the same. Is that true? Is fentanyl different to morphine and, 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 and remifentanyl, or, or do they have different effects? I think that's a fair question. You know, fentanyl is definitely the one that I'm most familiar with from the studies that we've done. There may be um, important effects, um, but in, you know, in Canada anyways, other, fentanyl is really the only opioid that's, that's used for intravenous sedation, except perhaps in the management of acute brain injury, where some of the shorter acting uh, uh, agents are, are preferred, but you know, I, I'd be interested to know if there's literature suggesting that there's important differences between the opioids. So you never ask a question without knowing at least part of the answer. So, so indeed, there's a little study, well, not a little study, there's a study, nice trial from Melbourne comparing fentanyl and morphine, but uh, anyway, it's not my talk, so, so indeed. I'll uh, look that up. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Great, All right. thank, thank you very much. Mm. Uh, mm. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, next speaker in this session, now uh, you've heard a little bit about uh, inhaled sedatives uh, alluded to, and Jeremy Beitler is going to tell us uh, all about it from uh, Columbia in New York. Uh, Jeremy. Hey, thank you so much for having me. So, I'm just going to make sure I keep an eye on the time so I don't run over. Um, so, it's a pleasure to, to be here today. Um, I wanted to start uh, just with a, a brief disclosure. So I have done consulting work for Sedona Medical, which uh, manufactures a device to give volatile anesthetics in ICU. That consulting work has just been in the context of designing a trial I now lead. Um, I don't endorse their products, uh, and these opinions are, are my own. I don't work for the company. Uh, so uh, I think as we've heard about already, uh, there is no one perfect sedative for all patients and scenarios. So I'm not here to tell you that volatile uh, anesthetics are, are the answer. Uh, but I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, how potentially um, uh, they might have a role in managing uh, sedation in uh, critically ill patients in ICU. And so I think the first thing is a little bit of a shift in language. You know, We want to be talking about volatile inhaled sedatives now because the goal is not general anesthesia. Um, the word volatile is defined as evaporating readily at often encountered temperature and pressure. It's also defined by a presidential candidate in my country. Um, and uh, there, there's really uh, three sedatives that uh, um, I think are uh, 
uh, are, are, have been evaluated and have potential to translate into the IC space. One is desflurane, uh, and then sevoflurane and isoflurane. And I think of the three, uh, several of the sort of unappealing properties of desflurane, uh, its expense, the fact that it can cause bronchospasm, bronchorrhea, um, are, are things that we do not want in our critically ill patients with acute respiratory failure. Um, so it's unlikely that desflurane will be used, and the two that have been investigated the most are really sevo and, uh, and iso. Uh, and the great advantage of this entire class of medication is that it, it works effectively without some of the consequences you see in other sedatives in the context of multi-organ failure. And that's because as a gas, it's eliminated by the body through, through exhalation. So it doesn't matter if you have renal failure, it doesn't matter if you have liver failure. Um, the, as long as you can get gas in and out of the lungs, which presumably we're doing if we're mechanically ventilating patients, uh, uh, this drug works very well without potentially risks of bioaccumulation or active metabolites or all those other things that you encounter with some other sedation. Uh, this is not a review talk on the, the mechanisms, except to say that there are many, uh, both uh, augmenting inhibitory signals and inhibiting excitatory signals. Um, and when I see articles like this, uh, my, my, my sense is that we don't really have a full understanding of how exactly this drug works because it does so many different things um, or this class of, of medications work. And so I think it's still a little bit of a mystery, but suffice it to say it, it, it acts uh, in the brain in several ways to induce this sort of unique type of sedation uh, that we, we see with patients getting this class of agent. So, uh, you know, what, one of the first questions is, you know, well, these drugs have been around for uh, over half a century. Isoflurane is on the WHO essential medications list, as FDA approved over half a century ago and grandfathered in. So why aren't they used already? Why is this not a common thing? And that's really not a, an issue with the drugs so much as it is with, with uh, the types of ventilators we use in the OR uh, versus in the ICU. So uh, uh, I apologize to the uh, anesthetists in the room uh, uh, who understand this far better than I, uh, but in the OR, sort of the classic setup is uh, an anesthesia loop circuit where you're rebreathing gas. And so um, when you administer a volatile anesthetic, the patient breathes it in, they exhale it, and it gets recirculated through that loop and they breathe it in again. And that's not how an ICU ventilator works, right? An ICU ventilator has separate limbs for inspiration and expiration. And so the technical advance was how do you overcome that problem uh, so that the patient potentially can rebreathe gas in the same way that they do on an OR anesthesia machine, but using an ICU ventilator that has separate limbs that are not connected together. And so there are a couple of, of sort of relatively modest uh, adaptations required. Um, one is obviously you need a way to deliver the drug. So instead of a big uh, gas machine where you're dialing it in, uh, you can just put the drug in a syringe and put it on a syringe pump. So it's not a great technical advance. Um, the second thing is uh, it requires a, a dry circuit uh, for reasons we'll talk about in a second. So if your hospital already uses uh, uh, heat, heat and moisture exchangers, HMEs, on your ventilators, you already do this. Um, in the U.S., they're still fairly common to use uh, what we call a heated wire or a wet circuit um, where there's humidity throughout the entire tubing. And so this would be a change for some, some hospitals in, in the U.S. Um, the reason that dry circuit is required is the third thing on the slide here, which is that um, the device that actually is used to, to vaporize the drug and reflect the drug is, is a modified heat and moisture exchanger. And so it's HME, just like any other HME, but with carbon fibers interwoven that uh, will bind the gas during exhalation and then reflect it back to the patient um, with the next breath into the ventilator. So it achieves that rebreathing of the anesthetic gas um, while allowing free passage of uh, CO2 and, and oxygen and other, other exhaled gases. So you replicate sort of that closed loop ventilation just for the anesthetic gas, uh, but not for other things that you're, you're breathing in and out. Um, and then that modified HME, the other piece to it is where the syringe pump infuses is on the patient side, and there's a bunch of little holes, and then the liquid drug just comes down to those little holes and vaporizes when the, the force of air comes from the ventilator uh, and toward the patient. So just a metal rod with some holes and a carbon filter is what it takes to, to deliver the drug. And then lastly, this sort of reflector, if you will, on the, on the HME is uh, you know, about 90% 90, 90 effective at capturing that gas and prompting rebreathing, but about 10% of the gas escapes past the reflector and makes it through the expiratory limb of the, of the ventilator. And so the fourth adaptation is on the ventilator itself. Uh, 
Um, it's kind of terrifying to think about this during COVID, but ventilators all have an exhaust port, just like a car. And so anything that comes out of the ventilator just gets spewed out of the back of it. And so we don't want that to happen with our anesthetic gas. So you can uh, put just a small uh, 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 gas scavenger that plugs just simple plumbing onto the back of the ventilator. Um, sort of anecdotally, some ventilators uh, don't mind that, and some actually don't function properly with it. So that's a technical limitation that I think will still need to be overcome for this to be uh, broadly available. There's a couple of ventilators that alarm when you start connecting things to the exhaust. Um, uh, so uh, wanted to, you know, rather than, again, have this be a focus of uh, reviewing the, the class of medication with, with which I think we're all uh, familiar, wanted to focus more on sort of the real world experience using this in the, in the ICU. And uh, to date, there's one uh, large uh, clinical trial that's been published. Uh, there's a couple of others we'll talk about in a second, uh, but wanted to highlight uh, this trial from Andreas uh, Meiser's group that was published in Lancet Respiratory Medicine a couple years ago. And so they enrolled 301 patients just broadly with ventilator dependent new respiratory failure, uh, randomize them to either isoflurane or propofol. And the goal in the trial was to prove that isoflurane could work as a sedative, right? We know from uh, over half a century of surgical experience that it works great as an anesthetic, but can you have light enough uh, um, therapeutic effect that it achieves a steady level of sedation depth, especially in spontaneous, in potentially in spontaneously breathing patients that might not have uh, might not as readily achieve a steady state as a paralyzed passive patient in the OR, where the goal is just obliterate any any type of consciousness. Um, so both arms in this trial received opioids for analgesia, um, and uh, 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 the study dr uh, treatment duration was only for for two days, for forty eight hours um, at most. So the main outcome, again, with the goal of proving that this could work as a sedative, was the proportion of time at a sedation depth, so anywhere between a RAS of minus one, which is uh, easily arousable to voice, um, to a RAS of minus four, which was needing physical stimulation to uh, wake the patient. And, uh, and with that broad range of sedation depth allowed, um, propofol and isoflurane performed equally well um, at achieving uh, um, a substantial amount of time at sedation depth. Um, that being said, in this trial, perhaps one of the limitations is that the level of sedation depth that was achieved was fairly deep. So from, from these data, it's not clear to me that if you want a patient that's lightly sedated at, say, a RAS of minus one, you know, very easily aroused, it's not as clear to me that this drug would work uh, well for that based on these data um, and my own anecdotal experience with it. Um, but one of the intriguing things is that, you know, part of the appeal in the operating room is, uh, you know, surgical time is money, so they try to turn over patients very quickly, which is one of the advantages of using volatile anesthetics as opposed to IV sedation as much. Um, and those findings were replicated in this critically ill ICU population. Um, uh, on day two, patients randomized to isoflurane woke up faster when the drug was stopped as opposed to patients receiving uh, propofol. So maybe there is a benefit to um, isoflurane for faster wake-up time. Um, you can imagine implications if given longer than potentially for amount of time on the ventilator. Um, so this is, a, I think, a, a notable finding. Another important thing is it seems like there's growing data um, that we can now assess that we, that we might not have known from the OR experience that there's a synergistic effect um, between opioids and volatile anesthetics. Um, and uh, the anesthetics might actually have some analgesic properties as well, especially synergistic analgesic properties with low dose opioids. And so um, this, uh, what they found in this trial, which has been replicated in cohort studies, is that patients receiving uh, isoflurane seem to have a lower opioid requirement, despite comparable good control of pain. Um, as uh, uh, Ewan uh, mentioned uh, in the last talk, one of the other intriguing areas uh, um, for which I think more data are needed is that it seems like isoflurane also may potentially better preserve spontaneous breathing than propofol. And I personally don't really know how to interpret these data because you could say maybe, maybe they're truly different effects of the drugs, or maybe it's the fact that what I just showed on the last slide is patients getting isoflurane require lower doses of opioids. And so that's the effect. So I don't, I don't, I don't think that's clear yet. Either way, the clinical effect I think is, is notable, but whether it's specific to the drug or just the fact that we're more aggressively dying back opioids, dialing back opioids because they don't need them is, is not quite as clear to me yet. Um, 
So importantly though, uh, in this trial, there were no safety signals, um, comparable uh, mortality, comparable me measures of organ dysfunction. And one, I think the, one of the missing things that will obviously be very relevant as this advances into the clinical space is that there was no assessment of long-term cognitive outcomes. And uh, you know, I know there's a fair amount of uh, controversy, or I think not, not much controversy, but some have voiced concern about uh, that issue of volatile anesthetics in, in the OR generally. It seems like the data don't necessarily support that. But you can imagine if this gets a, if this is widely used, and now patients are getting volatile anesthetics for many, many days or weeks on end, that's a data-free zone. Um, and I don't think our experience in the operating room extrapolates to give us such confidence that we're that we can say definitively there's not a risk. So what about patients with severe lung injury? So if this is an inhaled drug, can you even get the drug into patients? Um, and so uh, Matthew Jabodon uh, and Claire von Franz uh, did a, uh, 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 a very nice sort of proof of concept uh, study. Uh, 50 adult patients with ARDS randomized them to sevoflurane in this case um, versus midazolam. And uh, they want to uh, look specifically for lung protective effects because there's a fair amount of preclinical literature suggesting there might actually be biological effects that facilitate lung and other end organ protection. And so uh, one of their findings uh, was that uh, P to F ratio was uh, greater in uh, patients who uh, received sevoflurane compared to midazolam. I think the big caveat there is if you scrutinize the table, tidal volume was higher in the sevoflurane group as well perhaps because of the uh, small amount of dead space that this device adds when it's put in line. Um, they were compensating for that. Uh, so it's not clear if that's a tidal volume effect or not, but even if that was due to tidal volume, uh, they showed biological evidence of lung protection, which I think makes this a more compelling case. So they measured both pl plasma and alveolar uh, levels of soluble RAGE, receptor for advanced glycation end products, which is a, a marker of alveolar type one pneumocyte injury, and found that that biomarker both measured in the lungs directly and measured in the plasma was, was attenuated in these ARDS patients if they were uh, receiving sevoflurane. So like an encouraging finding that there might be end organ protective effects. So what about safety of taking this uh, out of the OR? Um, well, one is obviously the risk of malignant hyperthermia that uh, people involved in the surgical theater think about quite a bit. We would start to, need to be, uh, start to need to think about that more broadly in our ICU patients if this becomes a sedative. That being said, um, both the risk of malignant hyperthermia and the outcomes are far better, far more favorable um, than the risk of developing propofol infusion syndrome and the outcomes with it. Malignant hyperthermia is a treatable condition with very low mortality. Pris is not. Um, so I think while this is certainly an educational gap that would need to be filled as this becomes more broadly used, um, I don't think of it as a limitation because it's uh, the safety profile is more favorable than, than for propofol. Um, the other thing that, which I sort of alluded to is that these agents are also volatile in terms of our knowledge about them. You know, we've, we've used these drugs for hours on end, maybe a day or two on end. Even that uh, Andreas Meiser's trial was only 48 hours. And as we know with other drugs, once they get approved, people are going to use them uh, you know, as they see appropriate in sort of an off-label way, if you will. And so one of the early warnings, just to, to remind us to have some humility about this, is that um, in, in Europe where uh, this setup is approved, sevoflurane is now given for many, many days or weeks on end in, in uh, some countries and some hospitals. And already there's a new safety signal that has never been described in the surgical literature around the risk of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus that develops after several days of exposure. And I highlighted here a case series, but there's also so several other case reports describing this phenomenon too. Um, the good news in this case is that it seems to be reversible um, when the drug is stopped. Uh, but just to say there's a lot we won't, that we're going to still learn as we give this drug for longer periods. Um, in terms of safety of the staff, uh, um, bedside ambient drug levels are negligible. Uh, there have been multiple studies done, both where they put sensors in, in the room and where they have staff when, uh, wear lapel pins that measure the exposure of that individual staff member. And in all cases, the exposure is less than what you would encounter just being a, a staff member working in the operating room. Um, and importantly, they're well below the US recommended limits um, for, for exposure to this. So while I think it's, it's fair to raise the concern, the data support uh, that this is not a safety issue for staff working with these patients. Um, so all this is to say that there's more data coming soon. There's several trials that are either completed or are about to complete um, that will provide a lot more data. Um, there's two uh, US trials uh, in the PI of one of them. 
uh, that are both on track to finish in the next couple months with enrollment, and so should be published hopefully within the next year. Um, those trials have long-term cognitive outcomes built into them. So we uh, uh, do a battery, battery of cognitive assessments at six months. Um, and then there's additional European trials um, looking at, I think, other important endpoints, including delirium and vent-free days, as well as a pediatric trial that completed enrollment um, and should be coming out uh, soon. So in conclusion, um, uh, I think inhaled sedation is, is easy to do with minor, potentially cheap adaptations to the ventilator circuit. Like I said, I think part of the appeal of this um, is that these drugs have been around forever and are incredibly cheap. Um, so it seems like this could be potentially a cost-effective way to provide sedation, even though it's potentially a sort of a new approach to it. Um, I think there's truly uh, intriguing preliminary findings, including the faster wake-up opioid reduction effects, and I think uh, very exciting potential superiority effects if these biological effects that have been alluded to in animal and human studies do in fact translate as we, as we test this more rigorously in large trials. And then lastly, I think there's a couple of key knowledge gaps and having humility about what we don't know, even though these drugs have been around for a long time, is so important, um, especially when it comes to neurocognitive outcomes and anticipating that there will be other things we learn um, as these drugs are studied more and given for longer periods. Uh, thank you for your time. Jeremy, thank you. Excellent. Any questions? I have one, and we still have a couple of minutes left before we flip over into the next session. So, so I do anesthesia as well as intensive care, and whenever I reach for the sevoflurane, my resident looks at me as if I'm an environmental vandal. <laughs> um, and you know, you've outlined the clinical benefits, and, and I, I similarly d engage in a discussion about why I'm doing that for that particular patient during the case. But uh, you, you mentioned that the device that you, uh, that you use uh, loses 10 of, uh, percent per, per breath uh, or minute volume um, of, of the agent into the uh, scavenging system. So, um, it, it, have you have you done, or have people done, uh, kind of cost benefit analyses and and uh, uh, environmental analyses of uh, the uh, use of inhaled agents compared to uh, alternatives? Uh, that's a, that's an excellent question. I know there are some uh, countries actually uh, that are concerned about the contribution of volatile anesthetics in the operating room, and so you can imagine if this becomes more common in the ICU space, that that conversation will advance further. Um, I think in terms of uh, environmental exposure, the fact that there is a scavenger system in some ways helps mitigate that risk. And I think the big question then is if, if a therapy like this really takes off, is there a way then to recycle the drug? Because then I think it would make a far more compelling case that it's environmentally friendly. Um, so it's an area with which I think a lot of data are lacking uh, and, and certainly opportunity for growth and advancement. Uh, the one, as people raise that very valid point as, as you have, I think uh, sort of one of the counters to that is as, as we, as you know, physicians, as we practice with a principal goal of caring for our patients, if you start to think about the environmental effects of all the other things we do, you know, just think about if you put in a central line, how much waste is going into the ground every time you open up a kit, a resident kinks a wire, you open up another kit, and all of that just goes into the trash can and magically disappears. Um, and, and so I think there's, there are many instances of waste streams in, in clinical care that uh, deserve attention, inclu including potentially this one. Um, so I agree completely. Good answer. Jeremy, one more question. How fast is it? It's a pragmatic question. How fast is it to set up a syringe with propofol and fentanyl versus setting up uh, volatile sedation? Uh, great question. So uh, it depends. It depends on the practice context. In the in the trial, it's it's tedious because of the the, the sort of regulatory and safety checks we have in place. But in and uh, countries that use this uh, more frequently, I think Germany is, I think, the highest user in the world. Uh, France use some parts of France use it uh, relatively regularly too. Um, uh, in those cases, the isoflurane bottle is in the cabinet in the ICU, and the nurse just goes, pulls it up in a syringe, and puts the syringe on the pump. And the amount of time it takes to put this device in line is the same as the amount of time it takes to put an HME in line, which is to say, 20 seconds. Um, and then the plumbing on the back is, it's literally just plug a tube on the back of the ventilator. So it's, it's a minute or two, not hours. And I would argue faster than it, uh, the time if you had to both put in an IV and then give the IV medication. Okay, so no barriers there. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> thank you very much. Great, Thanks. thank you. Excellent talk. Are we having a break or not? Having a break? Oh.
Um, we will not be stopping for any more discussion as we had discussion after each talk. And we would like to um, invite Professor Patrick Onore um, to give a talk. Is the use of propofol safe during ECMO? The floor is yours. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. So I will uh, speak in the next 15 minutes about is the use of propofol safe during ECMO and probably more effectively when you are decannulating an ECMO. Hmm, is this possible? So I have no disclosure for this talk. And so, overview, definition of propofol infusion syndrome, related infusion syndrome, obviously. Some mechanism, much more controversial, I have to say. What's happening to propofol in ECMO circuit? And then, what's happening to propofol after ECMO decannulation? Hmm. And then, some uh, case report. And what should alarm us, and what kind of conclusion can we make it? Now, according to the Pediatric Critical Care Society, because you know that in 1992, the first case was reported in pediatric, and since then is not anymore used uh, um, with the age below 16. There are some effects related to those, cardiac failure, metabolic acidosis, fever, and hypertension. There are also some cumulative dose related effects, rhabdomyelitis, uh, hypertoglycidemia, and then some duration related effect, arrhythmia, and uh, ECG change, as you will say. And then there are some idiosyncratic, like uh, acute kidney injury, not really known why, and hepatomegaly. Now, regarding the mechanism, that's much more complex. We have some hypotheses made by the, again, the pediatric Critical Care Society of uh, US in 2023. And on the left part, you see a possible disruption to the electron transfer um, chain. And you have a reduced ATP production. You have an increased anaerobic respiration. And this will lead to cellular hypoxia, metabolic acidosis, and a really big reduction of oxygen supply to the tissue, which is not good. Right, some possible problem with lipid metabolism. Again, you have an inhibition of fatty acid oxidation into the mitochondria, and then you have accumulation of fatty acid and high triglyceride and a reduction of ETP production, further reducing down the oxygen supply for the tissue. Okay. Now, we had a similar case in our ICU, but we are still dealing with the data. So I took a, a case from the literature, a very nice case from the initial Mayo Clinic in Rochester in the US, where they had a propofol related infusion syndrome after decannulation of a ECMO. Hmm, bizarre. So, pharmacokinetic. We know that, unfortunately, there are no guidelines for sedation during ECMO. Hmm. Embarrassing. So everyone does what they think is best. And some people are using propofol. I do also. But we should need surely some uh, guidelines. Now we know, unfortunately, that a lipophilic agent, 
such as propofol, can be sequestered in the extracorporeal circuit of ECMO, tubing, oxygenator, and if you have a large surface of oxygenator, ooh, might be very huge. Uh, okay, that's something we need to know. And this is obviously decreasing the propofol uh, concentration in the bloodstream of the patient if you have uh, an ECMO not awake but on sedation. Sometimes it is, and most of the time. So, you would need higher dose of propofol to have the sedation that you would want for this patient. Okay, if we can do it without sedation, it's better. It's not always possible, sorry. Now, we know that even more complex is that VV ECMO is sequestered much more than VA ECMO. We don't know why. Something bizarre, but it's been described. So it's more dangerous to uh, have a decannulation of a VV ECMO rather than a VA ECMO, nevertheless. And as I said, the need for sedation is sometimes unavoidable and frequently necessary to promote comfort, uh, alleviate pain, anxiety, relieve agitation, distress from the acute illness, and facilitate ventilator synchrony. Okay. Now, excessive use of sedative can have adverse outcome. We learned this. Sedation needs in ECMO are often safety related, not always, but sometimes. You can have a key theater dislodgement of malposition, especially if you have a centrally cannulated VA ECMO with an open chest. Uh, you try to reduce uh, coughing and valsalva, which will negatively impact venous drainage and facilitate comfort and ventilator synchrony. Um, and we go to the case of uh, proper for related infusion syndrome after the cannulation of a VA ECMO. It can also happen in VA ECMO, not only in VV. Okay, so. 57-year-old man, classical story, emergent multivessel coronary artery bypass grafting, cabbage, arctic valve replacement for uh, this triple vessel coronary artery disease, and intraoperatively did quietly badly because he went into cardiogenic shock and also hypoxemic uh, respiratory failure and they had to put him on central V ECMO and his chest was obviously left open and within one week hmm, pretty good his hemodynamic status and oxygenation improve allowing for ECMO decannulation mm, nice great so after the cannulation, mm, one day after, the patient developed ventricular arrhythmia. Well, they said it's probably due to this heart. Don't worry. And then they saw a rapidly progressive acute kidney injury, despite the patient was not yet in shock. What is this? God. Mm -hmm. And then he developed severe hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, lactic acidosis, and they had to put him on vasopressors. So this started with vasopressin, 0.02 to 0.04 units per minute, and a low dose of norepinephrine, 0.03 mg per kilo per minute. And then they calculate the vasoactive inotropic support, the V-score, and it went up from 1.6 to 13.5 after 24 hours. Look at this. So 
This is when they decannulate the patient and you see a rising in the vasoactive inotropic score. What's happening? Well, if you are decannulating a patient that been, in this case, several days on propofol, propofol is sequestered in the tubing and in the oxygenator, and you are getting back the blood flow to the patient, which is washing all the propofol along the tubing and the oxygenation back to the patient. So you increase dramatically the propofol concentration in your patient. And that might uh, have a duration of two, three days. So something extremely important to have in mind. If not, the patient will die. And so he yeah, had also a very high level of lactic acid and hyperkalemia, despite having a relative good cardiac function, cardiac index of 2.3 liter per minute per square meter, and a modest acute kidney injury. So they said, we need to look at something else, esenteric ischemia. Okay. So they said, we will uh, go with the ECMO, but unfortunately, they had also a CRT on the ECMO, and the CRT at this aspect, because of the very high triglyceridemia, there was a, a clogging of the filter. So they had to put the filter on, on side, going with the ECMO to the CT scanner, and fortunately, there was no ischemic mesenteric uh, problem. Now, I mean, Based on the constellation of this finding, they said, okay, should be a proper for related infusion syndrome. And then they said, we will stop the proper for that was used because it was off the ECMO, but very agitated and was not possible to do without it. So they win it in 24 hours, slowly, I have to say. And then they find a huge level of triglyceride. Uh, also from uh, CK and then liver involvement. And if you see the triglyceride, it start when the patient came in in the ICU with the open chest and the central VA ECMO, and then rose already before decannulating on the 16th, the VA ECMO. And then after decannulation, bumping to 1,600 of triglyceride. Luckily enough, it did not, not do a severe acute pancreatitis. That would be even worse. And when they stop between the 19 and the 20, um, the 18 and 19, sorry, the propofol, you see a decline but not so rapid of triglyceride because you have still the propofol that went inside the body from the washing of the VA ECMO. If you look at the propofol infusion, as I said, between the 18 and the 19, they were decreasing slowly. But look at the lactate. At some point, it was around 10. <laughs> you say, well, we lose this patient. Hmm, bad. Now, fortunately, they were able to manage correctly the, this patient and everything went back to normal, hemodynamically, normal triglyceride, normal level test, and his kidney function improved very slowly. And it took about two weeks with uh, intermittent hemodialysis. So this was a pre syndrome, and we know it's associated with biochemical abnormality, severe metabolic acidosis, acute kidney injury, hyperkalemia, life-threatening arrhythmia, rhabdomyolysis, hepatic injury, hypertension, and leukemia. Risk factor are 
include a high dose propofol, 5 to 6 mg per kilo per hour. They give a low dose, but what kind of dose the patient had when he had a, a washing of propofol inside his body? Nobody knows. They didn't, uh, they didn't measure it. And we know from the literature there is no clear relationship with the levels and the clinical response. Somewhat unreliable. So, if I can conclude, Mr. Chairman, I would say that PRIS, when you have shock, lactate, hyperkalemia, cardiac failure, high triglyceride, please think about, especially after uh, decannulation of ECMO. Need increase of vasopressors, hypokalemia that can induce ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. Although it's not hypokalemia itself, it can be also due to cardiac failure and some side effect of uh, propofol as well. It's very complex. Uh, propofol is sequestered in the tubing and oxygenator, as I told you, and especially in VV, more than VA, but nevertheless, can happen in VA also, and then you have huge amount of propofol going back to the patient for several days. And when ECMO is weaned off, blood returns to the patient and is washing all the propofol, as I was telling you. And if those signs appear after weaning of ECMO, think about PRIS, because the mortality is still 50%. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for one quick question. Anybody from the audience? Okay. Thank you very much. The next talk will continue what we have just started. And we would like um, Professor Giovanni Landoni to tell us if propofol can be harmful. Um, Giovanni comes from Vita Salute San Raffaele University in Milan. Good morning to everyone. My disclosures, which are not going to affect my talk of today, my San Rafael Hospital and University in uh, Milano. And uh, yes, definitely, more than 300 million people receive uh, sedatives and or anesthetics every year worldwide and uh, proper for is most likely the most frequently used drug. The problem is there is uh, some signal of potential detrimental uh, effects. Some of them uh, you probably know. Uh, I think one of them you don't know. So in uh, 2003, there was a warning of the FDA towards the use of propofol in children. And this came from a randomized trial which was never published and which you cannot find anywhere. So hundreds of children were sedated with uh, standard uh, sedatives, which were at that time a mix of uh, everything. And then and they died in 4% of the cases. Then they were uh, randomized to be sedated to propofol at some concentration. Mortality was at 8%. And then they were randomized to propofol at a higher concentration and those. And mortality was 11%. Uh, so never published. You cannot find it on the web. Even myself, I cannot find it. Uh, there is also only one resident of mine who can surf on the dark web and who found it. Uh, it was just spread as a doctor lecture. So, I mean, I think every ICU physician who deals with children is somehow aware that this is not a good drug for uh, children. But I found it... Uh, extremely surprising to find uh, to find this result which was never published and never uh, 
publicized. In 2015, I was still not aware of this randomized trial. I did the meta-analysis of all the randomized trials ever performed in medical history on propofol versus anything else. We found a disturbing 10% uh, increase in mortality, but that was not significant and nobody read or cited this uh, manuscript. Uh, what happened the last year is that we updated this meta-analysis and we published it in uh, Critical Care. And I think everybody read it or heard about it, uh, probably because we had double number of patients, double number of uh, uh, trials and uh, because it went viral on social media. So this is a meta-analysis where propofol was compared versus any comparator and where we focused at, on mortality at any time point, at the longest follow-up available from each author, from each uh, study. 252 trials included. It is a bit disturbing that there are more than 300 randomized trials which did not report mortality, even after I stalked them through email asking for uh, additional data. And this is the main finding of uh, the study. So we found a significant increase in mortality when patients were randomized to propofol. This is approximately a 10% increase uh, in uh, mortality from 4.3 overall to 5.2. And the number needed to harm is 235. That is uh, terrifying from one side. On the other side, it makes it impossible to the human mind to see this effect outside a very, very large randomized uh, setting. We added a bit of Bayesian to this meta-analysis, which is telling us there is a 98% probability of mortality increase when using uh, propofol. So Mr. Bayes is quite sure that this signal from literature is there and is true. Uh, in uh, the cardiac surgical setting, this effect is uh, larger, more consistent. The probability of harm is extremely high. In other settings, the effect is there, is not so strong, but is still uh, very, very upsetting. So the clever reviewers asked us to do multiple subgroup uh, and sensitivity analysis. What is interesting is that all of them go in the same direction. So harm when patients were randomized to propofol, and more or less, the magnitude of the effect is the same, approximately a 10% increase in mortality in every setting, every subgroup. Are there limitations in this meta-analysis? Yes, of course, there are many, as in all meta-analysis. There are 16% of the studies which were at high risk of bias. If we remove them, nothing changes. The design is unblind in the vast majority of the trials. I think there is no way out about this. Uh, it is a propofol versus the rest of the world, as someone wrote on the social media. Yes, it is a very heterogeneous um, comparators. Mortality has been taken at different time uh, points, so this is not exactly mortality at 28 days. This is a bit of everything, but this is what has been reported by authors. Of course, there are many other um, uh, problems with meta-analysis, but there are also many strengths. If you are a clever guy who, when pick up a meta-analysis, goes straight to the final plot to see if it is worth going on, spending time and reading it or not, you will like this uh, final plot because it is symmetrical. If you ask the computer if this is really symmetrical or not, it will say mm, not exactly symmetrical. There is a small signal of a small study, study bias which reinforces the message of the meta-analysis. So there are few 
unpublished hidden small randomized trials which are against propofol and which have never been published. If the computer adds it to the meta-analysis, the signal on this mortality effect strengthened. Was it just something from the past? So this is a bubble plot showing that over the decades, this signal of a 10% mortality increase uh, stays uh, there. So it was not something of the last century or of the beginning of this uh, millennium. This is a TSA that is just supportive. Probably the, this, sign, this uh, message is not uh, definitive. There is uh, definitely the possibility to do, we must do further uh, studies. So this is the response of the scientific community, letters to letters to letters to the editor, and some to myself, some were polite, some were not. We try to respond uh, politely. And uh, at some point, uh, uh, Jean-Louis had to write an editorial himself uh, to tell uh, to the colleagues, please stop writing letter. I mean, uh, I published four of them, uh, the polite one. Uh, I went several times with the statistician through the uh, manuscript. The manuscript is, uh, is okay, is well written. If you don't like the message, uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is your problem. And uh, let's see how the debate will go on over the years. Uh, the main issue was uh, for the statistical giants that the main analysis was uh, significant with the fixed effect, but not significant with the random effect. That is, well, you can disagree or not. Anyway, yesterday night we updated the meta-analysis. We put all the data, just for easy term, the data of the the randomized trial published in the last 12 months, and now there is significance also with the random effect. I mean, so even the major uh, complaint of the statistical guys on that meta-analysis should be fixed. So I think we all love propofol, including myself, because we use it every day, rapid, shorter life, manageable hemodynamic effect. So I think it's the wonder drug. It helps our work a lot. But which might be the mechanism of action of this detrimental, uh, potential detrimental effect? Is it the risk of infection? The risk of infection is there. It has been uh, described at least 74 clusters of infection. I don't think this is the, the issue. This is one of the multiple potential uh, issues. Is it the probable infusion syndrome? Who knows? Probably this is uh, those related. There is probably some setting where this is the problem. The, 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 the previous lesson was fantastic, original. I will think about it for weeks. Uh, so proper infusion syndrome is, a, is an issue. I'm not sure, I'm, I don't know if it is an on and off uh, problem or if it, every, every additional dose of propofol brings some risk of some acidosis or whatever. I'm not sure this is the effect. Is it hemodynamic instability? So the expert colleague will say that this depends on the dose. So I'm not sure that this is the issue. Even if, even if I suggest you to read this manuscript and uh, intubating a patient in the ICU who is at risk of cardiovascular collapse. Uh, the only preventable risk factor to save his life is to avoid propofol and use other better agents, which can be intuitive, but this has been documented in a non-randomized uh, way. So my favorite uh, uh, potential uh, mechanism of action is uh, uh, the possibility that propofol has uh, to inhibit the organ protective properties of other agents. So many agents that we are using daily in our patients have some organ protective properties. There is a signal in literature telling us that these organ protective properties are inhibited 
by propofol at the mitochondrial level. So it is not harmful itself, it somehow inhibits the organ protective properties of other portions, other drugs that we are administering to our patients. This is a bit reassuring, and this is why I still daily use propofol. I say I'm not using something that is harmful by itself, I'm just in inhibiting some other uh, effect. I'm a bit lazy myself. And uh, so this uh, summarizes the potential mechanisms of action. And uh, yes, there are several ongoing uh, trials on propofol, probably 100. Uh, none of them is the one. I think the biggest one is between 10,000 and 20,000 patients. I think that will not be enough uh, to confirm uh, a signal of harm. Thank you very much uh, to the first authors of this uh, manuscript. I think Yuki Kotani is in this room. Uh, Alessandro Pruna is from remote. And this is the take-home uh, message. So, according to numbers, according to published literature, all randomized, there is a signal of increased mortality when propofol is compared versus any other comparator. We are talking about 30,000 patients. Uh, this signal is confirmed in magnitude and direction in several subgroups and subsetting. The number needed to harm is 235. Uh, of course, it would be fantastic if someone would have the energy to perform the study in the future, even if uh, bureaucracy and cost uh, are definitely limiting these days. Um, I find it disturbing that colleagues worldwide are publishing middle-sized randomized trials on propofol without reporting survival data. This is going, this is happening again and again. The last two ones have been published a few weeks ago, 400 patients, 500 patients, no mortality data reported. You, I write to the author and they do not reply because of course they did not collect it so they cannot go to the medical chart just for, uh, for me. So for the time being, uh, maybe we might consider a dose reduction when possible and uh, maybe in few selected cases, alternative uh, agents or sedation rotation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, we have got some minutes for questions from the audience. Who would like to ask a question? Here we go. Marcus Krivars, Helsinki, Finland. Thank you. Very provoking uh, talk, but, but well, well done and congratulations for this work. Your last line is, consider alternative agents, sedation, rotation, dose reduction whenever possible. So now when we all go home, so what should I use in the ICU instead of propofol? And B, what should I tell my cardiac surgery colleagues to use instead of propofol? This is a very e simple question. Yeah, yeah, the question is simple. <laughs> <laughs> so... We have seen a fantastic uh, presentation about uh, inhalation, volatile inhalation uh, agent. That is a possibility. It's, it's user friendly, it makes sense. Uh, I think that uh, slowly, slowly over the years, uh, we will use them uh, a bit more. I'm aware there is uh, remimazolam. I've used it in three patients for short procedures, and it is a wonder drug. I have no idea if the prolonged use of it is uh, sustainable from a cost point uh, of view. I think then that each ICU might find its uh, combination. I mean, if we look at uh, easy of use, there is nothing like putting propofol and, uh, and turn on the other uh, side. I think that slowly, slowly, the scientific community and each hospital should, should uh, find out if there is an, another possibility of sedation. In the past, we used benzodiazepine, but that, is probably, that probably belongs to the past. So what about the cardiac uh, surgeons? Uh, 
I, sh I think we shouldn't tell them for the time being. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit scared about their reaction, uh, but uh, I think we should discuss among ourselves and find a solution in the next months or years. Of course, now the cardiac surgeons will always br blame the propofol. Yeah. Whatever the, happens, they can yeah. always blame the propofol. Sure, sure. <laughs> it will be the culprit now. <laughs> sure. Giovanni, one more question. Thank you uh, for answering the previous one. It, what, the research that you have done and published focuses on propofol itself, but it also focuses on research quality. So do you think the message should be to the chief editors of all journals accepting propofol studies that they should not accept um, articles or papers without mortality data? Oh, yes. So I know you are reviewers editors or chief editors, I think uh, that is important. Or at least uh, do the best uh, to ask this data to the author when you still have power. I mean, if I ask them thereafter, I have no power to get this data. But uh, during the peer review process, that can, be, that can be obtained. So yeah, thanks for pointing this out, definitely. Maybe just one more. So you've talked about the potential for answering this question with trials, and we've heard a lot in this conference about personalised medicine as well. So my question is, do you really think a trial is the answer? If we had a trial of 50,000 people that showed, I don't know, a 0.5% increase in mortality, do you think there would still be a reason to think my patient in front of me is going to be better off with propofol, despite the average patient doing more poorly? So the point to do or not to do a large randomized trial at this point is, uh, is a nightmare for me. I mean, I don't think a 50,000 study is enough. I think a 1 million study <laughs> will be enough. And with the current bureaucracy, we cannot do it. I mean, we can do it in a couple of days without bureaucracy. But at the moment, we, we can't. So I don't know what is the answer. And uh, I'm personally still using uh, propofol with the surprise of my residents <laughs> uh, because the difference is, uh, is so small that I think that uh, the, the, the scientific community as a whole should find a, a solution or a suggestion to this. Very good. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Mm. Now, our last speaker in this session is Ari Serpe Neto, originally from Brazil, but uh, now uh, where I trained at the Austin Hospital in Melbourne in Australia. Ari. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. So I think personalized or individualization uh, is the topic of this, this symposium this year. So let's talk a bit about the personalized sedation, whatever this is. So but this is, I don't have any disclosure related to this presentation. And my idea is just to the first two topics of my presentation, we will just discuss all the concepts that they don't apply only for sedation, they can apply for any topic in critical care. And then discuss a bit how to personalize talking about patient selection, drug selection, and probably uh, give a bit of information just after Giovanni about maybe some patient selections that could benefit from different sedations. So current challenge is the same as we have with other topics in the field. So this can be a septic patient. This can also be a septic patient. This can also be a septic patient. And depending on the inclusion and exclusion criteria of our trials, they can all be enrolled in the same trial. And then, of course, at the end, it will be really hard for us to find something. They're, exactly, they're not exactly the same patient. So what can we do? So we discussed this a lot here already, but like we can start with subgroups. Let's take ARDS as an example. We can get subgroups of ARDS, pulmonary and extrapulmonary ARDS. We know that some ventilation strategies like PEEP, they have different responses if the patient has like pulmonary or extrapulmonary ARDS. So this is a first layer of, let's call, personalization. You can look for phenotypes. And we are also talking a lot about phenotypes. It's a new word, so we love it. So we can have phenotypes of hyperinflammatory patients or hypoinflammatory patients. And we also have data in ARDS showing that some, some interventions like statins or, or, or like uh, PEEP, they have differences, uh, uh, different effects based on the phenotype of the patient. Again, just post-hoc analysis, we need to validate this in clinical trials. And then we can always finish with the endotypes. 
it's even more like we have even more details from there. Like you can have adaptive endotype, coagulopathic endotype. So this is the way to go, but we still have a lot to do. So what's the concept of the personalized sedation? So usual clinical trials, we basically do like that. We don't have any degree of personalization. We randomize all patients fulfilling inclusion and exclusion criteria, and we compare two treatments. And then we end up with neutral trials, as we always do. You can have like some degree of personalization when you select some specific characteristics. You create a subgroup of patients, and you compare the treatment. So for example, you can have some prognostic enrichment and select patients with a PF ratio below 150 in ARDS. And then maybe you can have some effect of prone position, for example. So this is a degree of personalization. You can have a combination of characteristics. You can create a cluster of patients, and then you can, we can, you can compare treatment A with treatment B. And then potentially you have an even a higher degree of personalization and a higher chance of finding something. And finally, I don't think we'll be there in the next maybe 50 years, but you can have genome selection, you can treat the individual. Oncology, it's not treating the individual, but they are really good with the genomes, with all the biomarkers that they use. So this is probably the way to go. And how to use it in, in, in ICU. So I really like the adaptive designs with the predictive enrichment. I think this is the future. This is not the future. We are already doing a bit, but I think this is the way to go. So we can have patients, we can have two subgroup of patients. We randomize these patients to treatment A or treatment B, but we know at randomization if they are subgroup A or subgroup B. We do an interim analysis at, at some point and we assess the response to the intervention and we can see something like that. Like for example, in the subgroup A, we can see some benefit or some signal for benefit with the intervention. So we can keep recruiting patients in this subgroup. And in subgroup B, there's no effect, so we just stop recruiting, uh, recruiting patients with the subgroup B, and then we increase the power of the trial. So this is a way to go. We always need to take care and always need to take into account the potential of heterogeneity of treatment effect. So imagine a trial, we have the age of the patient, we create three subgroups, 18 to 35 years, 35 to 55, 55 to 70, we have uh, three subgroups based on the age of the patient. We run the trial, we have a lot of patients randomized, we have different effects. And we can clearly see in this first example here that it's pretty, it's pretty spread. So we, we don't have like the average treatment effects of the entire sample and subgroups are exactly the same. So there's no heterogeneity of treatment effect. Imagine a second situation, same subgroup, same idea. We randomize patients and then we have a different pattern. We can clearly see here that in the subgroup of 35 to 55, there is a difference. So the average treatment effect that we will show in a trial without taking into account the heterogeneity of treatment effect would be the same average treatment effect of the first trial where there was no heterogeneity of treatment effect. But if we focus on this subgroup, we can clearly see that the treatment effect is different. So in this case, we have heterogeneity of treatment effect and we need to take this into account. So, how to apply this to the sedation. So let's just start with a bit of patient selection. This is the SPICE 3 trial. You all know uh, Professor Yaya Shehabi from, from Australia did it with a lot of colleagues around the world who contributed a lot to the trial. A lot of patients randomized to sedation with dexmedetomidine or usual care. In this study, usual care was mainly propofol. So really good discussion that Giovanni had in the previous lecture about it. So it's basically a trial of dexmed against propofol. So we selected some patients and we divided them first according to the age. 65 was the cutoff. This was a pre-specified subgroup in SPICE 3 and they found a heterogeneity of treatment effect based on age. And we also created two clusters of patients. So we got a lot of variables. These are the variables that we used. We applied a method called K-means. It's basically we just asked the computer and the algorithm, okay, these are the variables that I think are really relevant. How many groups you find? So we don't ask the computer. We don't say, I want two, three, or four. I just say, take this into account and just answer me. How many groups? And the computer said, okay, I can find two clusters of patients. The two clusters of patients I will show in the next slides, they have very different characteristics. So let's start with the age. So when we just divided the patients according to age, you can see uh, here, basically, most of the patients, they had very similar reasons for admission. Of course, younger patients were more often admitted from the emergency room. And then we checked the trial, the mortality, that was the primary outcome. This is the overall trial, 29.1 against 29.1. Zero treatment effect, no difference at all. Then in patients, when we divided the patients by age, they had similar severity, but older patients were more often admitted from the ward due to cardiovascular condition, while younger patients were more often admitted from the ED due to trauma. And then when we checked the difference in the treatment effect, you can clearly see. So in 
older patients, the use of dexmedetomidine was reduced the mortality. This is just a numerical reduction on like almost 5%, while the use of dexmedetomidine in younger patients increased the mortality by almost 4%. And what about the clusters? So two clusters of patients, major difference. Cluster one, surgical patients with lower severity. Cluster two, medical patients with higher severity. Again, we found some heterogeneity of treatment effect here. So in cluster one, with surgical patients with lower severity, the use of dexmedetomidine reduced the mortality by 3%, while in the cluster two, with medical patients with higher severity, it was pretty similar, but the use of dexmedetomidine increased by 1% mortality at 90 days. We did a Bayesian analysis using like a Bayesian heterogeneity of treatment effect strategy, and you can clearly see here that in uh, older patients, so more than, uh, older than 65, the probability of benefit with dexmedetomidine was 98%. So very probable that the use of dexmed in this population uh, reduced mortality. While the probability of benefit with the use of dexmed in the younger population was only 1.5%. And I think this reflects the practice, at least my practice. If I try to sedate my patients with, pro with dexmedetomidine and they are really young and really severe, it doesn't work. I have to use a lot and it doesn't work. And we can clearly see the effect. It looks like the point is exactly 65 years old. So we are running SPICE 4 in Australia. So Yaya is running SPICE 4 in Australia and, and worldwide, just assessing the impact of dexmedetomidine in patients older than 65. And again, even if we, if we take into account the severity of the patients, it's always there. The probability of benefit is always higher in older patients, even if the patient is very sick or not. The cluster is not exactly like, like the age, but we can still see that the probability of benefit in cluster one, there were surgical patients with lower severity, was 85%, while the probability of benefit in cluster two was only 33%. So some degree of heterogeneity. And again, if, if we take into account the age, we, we confirm it. And again, I think this is, this, is, this is probably what we see at the bedside. If you try to use Dexmed to sedate a medical patient with a higher severity of units, it's really hard. If the patient is just a post-op, lower severity is much easier. So overall, in this trial, we found heterogeneity of treatment effect of dexmedetomidine, higher probability of reduced mortality in older patients, and higher probability of increased mortality in uh, non-operative seeker patients. Reasons, several. Potentially the dose. So we need higher dose of dexmedetomidine to achieve the same level of sedation in younger patients. We did this analysis. This is called double stratification using resampling. Because of the time, I'm not going into detail, but it's basically we created different groups of matched dose of one sedatives and increased dose of others. And in this specific group, in younger patients to achieve a higher level of sedation, if the doctors decided to use propofol, it was associated with a better outcome, but no change in older patients. So it looks like in younger patients, the increasing dose of propofol was associated in, in, the, in this trial with reduced mortality. Conversely, increasing dexmedetomidine may be associated with increased mortality. So it looks like dexmedetomidine, it's probably good for like older patients, non, uh, like operative post-op patients. Cardiovascular conditions, we did the same. We assessed uh, heterogeneity of treatment effect in patients with, uh, admitted to the ICU due to cardiovascular conditions. And again, the use of dexmedetomidine in this specific group of patients was associated with a reduction in 90-day mortality, even after adjustment for several confounders. So potentially something good for patients with cardiovascular uh, disease. And we did something that the, the, they presented a, a sub-study in the first session, in the first uh, uh, day of the meeting about individualization of O2 or targets of oxygenation. This is something similar that we did using conditional average treatment effect in a Bayesian framework. And we can again see that increasing age, dexmedetomidine is more likely to be better. And we even created some recursive partitioning plot. So if you have a patient that is older than 65, if the patient has lower severity, probably the best recommendation is dexmedetomidine. But if the patient is like younger, there is probably no recommendation that we can make from the model. And if the patient has high severity of units, again, there is no recommendation. So just a way that we are starting trying to understand what's the best population. And even like in my practice, if you ask me, do you use dexmedetomidine to sedate your patients? No, I don't use. I like to use dexmedetomidine to treat delirium, to treat agitated patients. But when we check the literature, only three studies assess the use of dexmedetomidine to treat delirium. Two from Australia and Michael Israel. So we have like a pilot showing that the use of dexmedetomidine compared with haloperidol in patients with agitated delirium was significantly associated with shortened median time to extubation. S a second study 
in post-op cardiac surgery patients showing exactly the same, but again, comparing now, comparing uh, against midazolam. And the DALIA study, that is maybe the largest uh, study in the field in agitated patients with the use of dexmedetomidine being associated with a, a reduction time to extubation. We did something similar, so we just got some real-world data from our hospital and said, okay, let's see the effect of dexmedetomidine in patients with agitation. So we did a, a, a target trial emulation using a strategy that we call cloning sensory and waiting to avoid some biases like the immortal time bias, survival bias, lead bias. And we just assess patients with agitation and then we randomized or, or we did a pseudo randomization of patients with like the use of early dexmedetomidine within 12 hours of agitation or no dexmedetomidine. And this is very preliminary data. We still need more patients, but clearly we can see a different in 30-day mortality if you use early Dexmed to treat delirium. And even if you use Dexmed within 24 hours of the onset of delirium. Again, this is preliminary, we're still uh, analyzing the data, but again, maybe we need to use Dexmed for patients with agitation, not to sedate patients. And what about drug selection? So just with one example of ketamine, we like to use ketamine. Ketamine is, we are using more. We use a lot of ketamine in our hospital for pain, but we know all the history about ketamine being associated with hallucination. So we said, okay, let's, let's check in our data set if this is true. So we just did again a target trial emulation, in this case using a longitudinal framework with marginal structural models and G formulas to avoid all the bias and to adjust for several time varying and, and baseline factors. And we found in this, that the use of ketamine was strongly associated with hallucination in ICU patients. Especially if you start ketamine in the first days of admission, the effect is much less pronounced if you start ketamine, for example, on day 10 to day 15. And of course, if you use only one day of ketamine in the early onset of the disease, it's still very likely to be associated with hallucination. While if you use just one day of ketamine, but in the late course, like day 10, the effect's not so, so pronounced. So, Again, maybe ketamine is not good for a prolonged period in a very early onset of the disease because it can create hallucinations in your patients. So it's another way of dealing with personalized sedation based on drug selection. So to finish, my take home message is clinical trials and personalized medicine are completely complementary. They are not like opposite. We always need to consider heterogeneity of treatment effect, and this can be based on patient characteristics, intervention characteristics, the timing, so we always need to consider it. And the enrichment is a potential solution. So we need better understanding of the mechanism to, to apply enrichment uh, in clinical trials. We need some advanced in bedside diagnostics because we need point of care measurement sometimes if you wanna do biomarkers. But there is a huge potential to reduce population and treatment heterogeneity if we use enrichment and to improve efficiency in clinical trials. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ari. Are there any questions? Just got a few minutes at the end of this session. So I've, I've got one. This is a philosophical question more than anything else. So, so you, your reanalysis of the SPICE 3 data was compelling um, around the effect of age and then the potential explanatory effects, complicated though they are, around the, the, the dose effects of, uh, that, that were correlated with age. So my question is, <clears throat> is that enough? Or, or do, do you really need to then go on and do another 4,000 patient trial to confirm <laughs> that old people do particularly well with dexmedetomidine? Yeah. yeah, it's a good question. I think my answer would be that we need the trial because this is what the regulation says and all the, the statistical uh, uh, discussions that we always have, the subgroups and we don't have power and blah, 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 as you know. So I think we need other trials. Uh, but I think like we need to improve efficiency and maybe the platform trials, we like perpetual trials that you just drop arms or drop subgroups and just, I think they are probably the best answer, but I would say yes, we need a trial because this is the way that we need to do. But like, uh, I think that sometimes we are very, very strict, like sometimes you find a very huge effect, but the subgroup was not pre-planned and then you just say, okay, it doesn't matter and sometimes it matters. So I think it's like a balance, but still we need trials to, to confirm it. Very much an opinion-based thing at the moment, yeah. isn't it? But maybe, maybe as the field advances, we'll, yeah. we'll settle on an opinion yeah. that we all agree on. Okay, if there's no other questions. I've got one more. Yeah, of course. Do you think personalization in sedation practices would lie in combination of different agents, but in lower doses? Good question. I, I don't have the answer, especially because it's really, so in this spice three, basically the dexmedetomidine arm was always combine a dexmed and propofol because it's really hard to achieve 
like some targets of sedation with only dexmed. I'm always in favor of having less and not combining a lot of things. I think it's easier to isolate the effect. So I don't have this answer. I would say that in my personal opinion, we need to do to use less and just try to isolate the effect, but we don't have the answer. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention and staying with us. Um, we are aware that you have got other, got other sessions to attend, so thank you very much for being with us. <laughs>